Hey guys, uh, it's reading time with me and Parker today, um, or Trevor and Parker, I'm Trevor, uh, Parker read chapter one, so if you missed that one, uh, go back and watch, uh, read, listen to chapter one, uh, today I'm going to read chapter two, so today we're reading Hatchet again by Gary Paulson, so here's chapter two, for a time that he could not understand Brian, could not do nothing, even after his mind began working and he could see what had happened, he could do nothing, it was as as if his hands and arms were led. Then he looked for ways for it not to have happen. Be asleep, his mind screamed at the pilot. Just be asleep and your eyes will open now, and your hands will take control and your feet will move to the pedals. But it did not happen. The pilot did not move except that his head rolled on a, on a neck and possibly loose as the plane hit a small bit of turbulence. The plane, somehow the plane was still flying. Seconds had passed, nearly a minute, and the plane flew on, as if nothing had happened and he could and he had to do something help he had he had to help he stretched one hand towards the pilot saw that his fingers were trembling and touched the pilot on the chest he did not know what to do he knew there was procedures that you could do mouth to mouth on victims of heart attacks and push their chests cpr but he did not know how to do it and in any case could not do it with the pilot who was sitting up in the seat and still strapped in with his seatbelt so he touched the pilot with the tips of his fingers, touched him on the chest, and could feel nothing. No heartbeat, no rise and fall of breathing, which meant the pilot was certainly dead. Please, Brian said, but did not know what or who to ask. Please. The plane lurched again, hit more turbulence, and Brian felt the nose drop. It did not dive, but the nose went down slightly, and, and the down angle increased the speed, and he knew that at this angle the slight... and. He knew that at this angle, this slight angle down, he would immediately fly into the trees. He could see them ahead on the horizon where before he could see only the sky. His head had to fly, he had to fly it somehow, had to fly the plane. He had to help himself. The pilot was gone beyond anything he could do. He had to try and fly the plane himself. He turned back in the seat facing the front and put his hands still trembling on the control wheel, his feet gently on the rubber pedals. He, you pulled... You pulled back on the stick and raised the plane. He knew that from reading. You always pull back on the wheel. He gave it a tug and slid back toward him easily. Too easily. The plane with the plane with the increased speed from the tilt down swooped eagerly up and drove Brian's stomach down. He pushed the wheel back in, went too far this time, and the plane's nose went below the horizon, and the engine's speed increased with the shallow dive. Too much. He pulled back again more gently this time, and the nose floated up again, too far, but not as violently as before. Then down, then down a bit too much, and up again very easily. And the front, and the front of the engine, cowling settled. When he had, when he had it aimed to the horizon, and it seemed to be steady, he held the wheel where it was, let out his breath, which he had been holding all this time, and tried to think what to do next. It was clear, blue sky day with the, with fluffy bits of clouds here and there, and he looked out of the window for just a moment hoping to see something a town or a village but there was nothing just the green of the trees endless green and lakes scattered uh, and lakes scattered more and more thickly as the plane flew where he was flying but did not know where he had no idea where he was going he looked at the dashboard of the plane studied the dials and hoped to get some help hoped to find a compass but it was also confusing and jumble a number a jumble of numbers and lights one light, one lighted display in the top center of the dashboard said the number three four two. Another next to it said two two. Down beneath, down beneath there was a dial with lines that seemed to indicate that the wings were doing tipping or moving. And one dial with a needle pointing to the number seventy, which he thought only thought might be the altimeter. Down beneath there was dials with lines that seemed to indicate where the wings were doing tip tipping or moving with one dial with a needle pointing to the number 70, which he thought only might be the all altimeter. The device that told him his height above the ground or above sea level. Um, somewhere he had read something about altimeter, but he couldn't remember what or where or anything about them. Slightly to the left and below the alt altimeter, he saw a small rectangular panel with a lighted dial or two knobs. His eyes his eyes had passed over it two or three times before he saw what was written in the tiny letters on the top of the panels. Transmitter 221 was stamped into the metal, and it hit him. Finally, this was, what his ra this, this was the radio. 
the radio, of course. He had to use the radio. When the pilot had, had been hit that way, he had been trying to use the radio. Brian looked to the pilot. The headset was still on his head, turned sideways a bit from his jamming back into the seat, and the microphone switch was clipped into his belt. Brian had to get the headset from the pilot, had to reach over and get the headset from the pilot, or he would not be able to use the radio to call for help. He had to reach over. His hands began trembling again. He did not want to touch the pilot, but did not want to reach for him. But he had to. He had to get the radio, lift his hands from the wheel just slightly, and held them waiting to see what would happen. The plane flew on normally, smoothly. All right, he thought. Now, now to do this thing. He turned and reached for the headset, slid it from the pilot's head, one eye on the plane, waiting for it to die. The headset came easily, but the microphone switch at the pilot's belt was jammed in, and he had to plug it, pull it to get it loose. When he pulled his elbow, bumped, it bumped the wheel and pushed it in, and the plane started down in a shallow dive. Brian grabbed the wheel and pulled it back too hard again, and the plane went through another series of stomach-wrenching swoops up and down before he could get it under control again. When things had settled again, he pulled out the mic cord once more, at, at last jerked the cord free. It took him another second or two to plane, two to plane the headset to, on his own and own head and position the small microphone tube in the in the front of his mouth. He had seen the pilot use it, had seen him um, depress the switch at his belt. So Brian pushed the switch into his end in and blew into the mic. He heard the sound of his breath in the headset. Hello, is there anybody listening on this? Hello, he repeated two or three times and then waited, but heard nothing except his own breath. Panic came then. He came. He had been afraid, had been stopped with, um, with terror of what was happening, but now panic came and he began to scream into the mic room, screaming over and over again. Help! Someone help me! I'm in this plane and don't know. Don't, don't know. He started crying with screams, crying and slamming his hands against the wheel of the plane, causing it to jerk down and then back up. But again, he heard nothing but the sound of his own sobs in the microphone, his own screams mocking him, coming back into the ears and the microphone. Awareness cut into him. He had used a CB radio in his uncle's pickup once. You had to turn the mic switch off to hear anything anybody else. He reached to his belt and released the switch. For a second, all he heard was whoosh in the empty airways. Then, through the noise and static, he heard a voice. Whoever is calling on this radio net, I repeat, release your mic switch. You're covering me. You're covering me. Over. It stopped and Brian hit his mic switch. I hear you. I hear you. This is me. He released the switch. Roger, I have you now. The voice was very faint and, and breaking up. Please state your difficulty in location and say over to signal the end of the transmission. Please state my difficulty, Brian thought. God, my difficulty. I am in a plane with a... I am in a plane with a pilot who is, who had a heart attack or something. He, he cannot fly, and I don't know how to fly. Help me, help me! He turned the mic off with, without any transmission properly. There was a moment of hesitation, but for an answer, your signal is breaking up, and I lost most of it. Understood. Pilot can't fly. Correct. Over. Brian could barely hear him now, hearing mostly noise and static. That's right. I can't fly. The plane is flying over now, but I don't know how much longer. Over. Lost signal? Your location, please. Flight number, location, over. I don't know my flight number or location. I don't know anything. I told you that over. He waited now, waited, but there was nothing. Once for a second, he thought he heard a break in the noise, some part of the word, but it could have been static. Two, three, four, ten pl minutes went by. The plane roared and Brian listened, but heard no one. Then he had switched again. I do not know the flight number. My name is Brian Robertson. And we left Hampton, New York, headed for the Canadian oil fields to visit my father. And I did not know how to fly an airplane. And the pilot, he let go of, of the mic. His voice was starting to rattle, and he felt as if he might start screaming at any second. He took a deep breath. If there's anybody listening who can help me fly the plane, please answer. Again, he released the mic, but heard nothing but the hissing of a noise in the headset. After half an hour of listening, repeating the cry for help, he tore the headset off in frustration and threw it to the floor. It all seemed so helpless. Even if he did get something, what could anybody do? Tell him to be careful? Also hopeless. He tried to figure out the dials again. He thought he might know which was what. It was a lighted number that read 160, but he did not know if that was the actual miles, an hour, kilometers, or if it just meant how fast the plane was moving through the air and not over the ground. 
He knew airspeed was different from ground speed, but di but not by much how, but not by how much. Parts of the book he read about flying came to him: how wings worked, how the propellers pulled the plane through the sky. Simple things that w that wouldn't help him now, though. Nothing could help him. An hour passed. He picked up the headset and tried again. He knew in the end he had he had, but there was no answer. He felt like a prisoner kept in a small cell that was hurling through the sky at what he thought would be 160 miles per hour. He didn't know where, he just headed somewhere until there it was, until what? Until he ran out of fuel, where the plane ran out of fuel it would go down, period. Or he could pull the throttle out and make it go down now. He had seen the pilot push the throttle to increase the speed. If he pulled the throttle back the engine would slow him down, the plane would go down. Those were his choices. He could wait for the plane to run out of gas and fall, or he could push through the fo push the throttle in and make it happen sooner. If he waited for the plane to run out of fuel, he would go farther, but he did not know which way he was moving. When the pilot had jerked, he had moved the plane, but Ryan could not remember how much or if it had come back to the original course. Since he did not know the original course anyway and could only guess at, the which, at which display might be compass, the one reading 342, he did not know where he had been or where he was going, so it didn't make much difference if he went down now or waited. Everything in him rebelled against stopping the engine and falling down. He had a vague feeling that he was a he was wrong to keep heading, heading as the plane was heading, a feeling that he might be off in the wrong direction, but he could not bring himself to stop the engine and fall. Now he was safe, or safer than it went if he went down. The plane was flying; he was still breathing. When the engine stopped, he'd go down. So the so the so he left the plane running, holding altitude, and, tr and kept trying the radio. He worked out a system. Every 10 minutes, by the small clock built into the dashboard, he tried the radio with a simple message, I need help. Is there anybody listening to me? In the times between transmission, he, he tried to prepare himself for what he knew was coming. When he ran out of fuel, the plane would start going down. He guessed that without the propeller pulling, the, pulling he would have to push the nose down to keep the plane flying. He thought he may have read that somewhere, or it just came to him. Either way, it made sense. He would have to push the nose down to keep flying speed, and then just before it hit, he would have to pull the nose back up to slow the plane as much as possible. It all made sense. Glide down, then slow the plane and hit. Hit. He would have to find it, find a clearing as he went down. The problem with that was he hadn't seen one clearing since they started flying over the forest. No swamps, or some swamps, but they had trees scattered throughout them. No roads, no trails, no clearings. Just the lakes, and it came to him that he would have to use a lake for a landing. If he went down in the trees, he was certain to die. The trees tear the plane to pieces, or the trees would tear the plane to pieces as it went into them. He would have to come down into a lake. Not on the edge of the lake. He would have to come down near the edge of the lake and try to slow the plane as much as possible just before he hit the water. Easy to say, he thought. Hard to do. Easy say, hard do. Easy say, hard do. It became a chant that beat with the engine. Easy say, hard do. Impossible to do. He repeated the radio call 17 times at the 10-minute intervals, working on what he would do between transmissions. Once he re reached over to the pilot and touched him on the face, but the skin was cold, hard cold, death cold, and Brian turned back to the dashboard. He did not... He did what he could, tighten his seatbelt position himself, rehearsed mentally again and again what his procedure should be. When the plane ran out of gas, he should hold the nose down and head for the nearest lake and try to fly, fly the plane kind of onto the water. That's what, now what he thought of. Kind of fly the plane onto the water, and just before it hit, he could pull back on the wheel and slow the plane to reduce the impact. Over and over, his mind ran in the picture of how it would go. The plane running out of gas flying the plane onto the water, the crash from pictures he had seen on television. He tried to visualize it. He tried to be ready. But between the 17th and 18th radio transmission, without a warning, the engine a coughed, roared violently for a second, and died. There was a sudden silence cut only by the sound of wind milling propeller and the wind past the cockpit. Brian pushed the nose of the plane down and threw up. So that's the end of our chapter two of Hatchet, and then um, be stay tuned for chapter three. Thank you.